Please open your Bibles to Exodus 31. Now, this might feel like a trick question, but uh, go with your gut, okay? As you answer this in your head, I don't want you to shout out an answer here. I just want you to think about it in your head. I want you to think about two career paths, okay? One, being a missionary in a faraway jungle, or being a CEO for a large corporation. Which one is more spiritual? Which one has more eternal value? Don't raise your hand. But did you first think, oh, that's easy, the missionary, of course. Let's think about Hebrews, the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11, don't turn there, you, you're familiar with it, a long list of men and women of faith over history who God has used as they played their part in God's plan. Fifteen of them are named in Hebrews 11. Okay, we know who they are, we know what they did. None of the first 14 could be described as people in full-time ministry. They were farmers, they were shepherds, they were tradespeople, they were kings, they were military leaders. One was even a former prostitute, Rahab, who married a man in Judah named Salmon. Their son was Boaz. She became the great-great-grandmother of King David, okay, a mom. The only one in the list who would be considered a clergy was the prophet Samuel. So the question is, in order to have a significant impact for God and for eternity, do I need to go into full-time ministry? Obviously, the answer is no. But it's a loaded question because it assumes, well, some people are in full-time ministry and others are in some kind of secular work. That is not a biblical worldview. Okay, we talked about it in the summer. Greek philosophy created this sacred-secular divide that frankly has infected the church for 2,000 years. Okay, it's called dualism goes back to a guy named Plato. The biblical worldview is different. The biblical worldview sees all work as sacred. Okay, Colossians 3 tells us this. Whatever you do, work how? How should we work? Heartily. As for who? The Lord. Not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving who? The Lord Christ. See, when we buy into the world's view of dualism, here's what we do. We tend to compartmentalize our lives into those areas that are secular, okay, like my job, my hobbies, my politics, even my family, and then those things that are sacred, like my faith, every area of our lives. Spirit-filled living touches every area of our lives, including our families, including our work, whatever that is. Okay, so the New Testament is clear about this. So what can we learn from the Old Testament? Well, we just sang it. God hasn't changed the design, the plans that he had for Israel as he rescued them, as he called them to play their special part in God's plan, it actually reveals some truths that we can apply to our lives today. So here's our big idea for today. God cares how you work and rest. All right, Exodus 31 is an important lesson in how God views work, and in how God views rest. So if you remember where we're at in the story, uh, God had called Moses up onto the mountain. If, 
if you look at the chapters before this, he gave him all these commands, all these instructions about how Israel was to play their part as a kingdom of priests to a lost world. Again, he wasn't telling them, do all these things so that you can be saved, right? He gave all these commands to people he had already rescued so that they could play their part. Um, God himself writes the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone. And then his final words to Moses, before he sends him back down the mountain with these tablets, his final words were about these two things, work and rest. Okay, those are two things that we spend the vast majority of our time doing. God cares about how we do those things. Whatever you do, you are serving the Lord. Let's pray as we dive into this. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is uh, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, it's able to divide um, soul and spirit, joint and marrow. So God, would you do that in our minds and in our hearts right now? May your word um, break down any thinking that's not true and help us to align our thoughts and our lives with what you say in your word. Amen. All right, so number one, pretty simple. When you're living by faith, your work matters to God. Now, some of you are still working, meaning that you're employed or you own a business or in some way you're making money through some type of labor. Uh, some of you are working, but it doesn't involve a paycheck. Moms who choose to stay home and raise their kids, are they working? You better believe they're working. <laughs> some of you are retired. Okay, you don't need to labor to produce revenue. But does that mean you get a pass on this point? No, I mean, what did we just read? Whatever you do. You see, God made us to be productive, to be contributing members of our society, but especially as followers of Jesus, God made us to be contributing members of his family. The Bible does not talk about retirement. Now, there's nothing wrong with not needing to labor at a job because you have the means to do that. Nothing wrong with that, but there is something wrong with retiring from playing your part in God's plan. See, I call this centering your life on me time. Hey, this is me time. Friends, for followers of Jesus, that's, that's not an option. Um, it's understandable that we slow down as we get older. Maybe we do different things. I love golf, all right? But I know some retired guys who play golf five times a week. Friends, that's not slowing down. I would be worn out. It's okay to play golf. But your obedience in God's call on your life, it matters. Okay, this, this is a big issue. It's a big issue, especially in Naples, all right? So I want us to be reminded, what was God's design before sin, before the fall? Genesis chapter 1, we'll put it on the screen. God kind of gives us his design here. He says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. So he made us like him to reflect him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, kind of gave them okay, the mission. Here it is. He said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Okay, sounds like there was going to be some work involved in that. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then in Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To work it and to take care of it until he was 65 or Social Security kicks in. 
See, what I want you to see here is that work is not the result of the fall. It's not the result of sin and, oh, now we have to go to work. God designed us to work before there was sin in the world. Work is part of his good design for us. I talked about the Greek philosophers. Greek philosophers saw work as a necessary evil. That's not how God views it. Now, sin has changed things. Sin has made work harder. We read that in Genesis 3. God said, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat from it all the days of your life. Your work just got harder, Adam. <laughs> it will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you are taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. So sin has made it harder, but it didn't change uh, God's design. Your work matters to God. Whatever you do, however you're participating, however you're contributing to God's plan and God's call on your life, whatever you do, it matters to God. And a few observations here from the text. First, to do our jobs. Um, what we can glean from Exodus 31 here is we see first, God gives us his spirit. So look at Exodus 31, verses 1 to 3. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. Now, right here in Exodus 31, this is not a blanket promise that God gives his Spirit to everyone. Not, that's not from this text but it is the first person in the Bible where it says directly God filled him with the Holy Spirit to do his work. And I think it's pretty significant. The first person mentioned in the Bible to be filled with God's Spirit was a craftsman, a laborer, an artist, not a minister or missionary or pastor. God gives us his spirit, not simply to do spiritual things. Remember, that, that's not a biblical category. He gives us his spirit to help us with whatever we do. Because whatever we do, we're serving who? Yes, the Lord Christ. Now, the New Testament is very clear about this. We studied it in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 5, if you'll remember, it says, don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. <laughs> Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then if you'll remember in Ephesians 5 and 6, he goes on and he talks about all the areas of life where being filled with the Spirit is to make a difference in our fellowship with other believers, in our homes, in our marriages, in parenting. And then he actually specifically talks about our workplaces. In Ephesians 6, it says slaves. Now, again, the word there really meant bond servants, which if you understood the culture and history, um, slaves, bond servants were essentially the employees in the Roman Empire. Okay, if you were an employee of somebody, you were called a bond servant. Same word we use for slaves. So it's not, don't think of like um, slavery in the United States as we remember it. It was a very different type of thing. So it's right to think about this as being employees. Right? Obey your earthly masters, your employers, with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely. How? As you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with what? Enthusiasm. <laughs> As though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Is that not clear? That's very clear. So even if you're retired, okay, even if your, your children are all raised and gone, friends, God still has a part for you to play. 
loving God, loving your neighbor, loving God's people. He's, he's given us his Holy Spirit to do whatever it is that he's, he's given your hands to do for now. Next, we see this. To do our jobs, God gives us skill. So let's read again, starting in verse 3 through 11. So God tells Moses, I filled this guy Bezalel with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and craftsmanship. Why? To devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I've appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I've given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. The tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat that is on it, all the furnishings of the tent, the table, its utensils, the pure lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin and its stand, the finely worked garments, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons for their service as priests, and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place. Wow. Well, if you take time to read chapters 21 to 23, 25 to 30, I think what you'll see, we got a taste of it there, God cares about the details. I mean, very specific instructions about how all of the items for the tabernacle, the place of worship, were to be made and constructed. And it, it just feels like there was no detail that was too small or too mundane for God to be interested in it. I, I've heard people say this. I don't want to bother God by asking for help with X, Y, Z. It seems so small. I'm sure he doesn't have time. He's not interested in these little things. Have you ever thought that? I mean, I, I've thought that. That's not true. Okay, Colossians 3 reminds us again, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, whatever it is. I've quoted this in the past. This is from a, an essay called Why Work, written by Dorothy Sayers, and this is what she says about work. In nothing has the church so lost her hold on reality as in her failure to understand and respect the secular vocation. And again, that's not a biblical category, but we understand what she's saying here. The church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. What the church should be telling him is this. The very first demand that religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. Amen? Don't diminish the work that God has for you. Oh, it's little. It doesn't change anything. It's not significant. It's not contributing to anything. Don't diminish it. He cares. It plays a part in his plan. He's given you his spirit. He's giving you the skill you need to do it as you, as you ask him to do it well and to do it for his glory. But in our text, we also see that to do our jobs, God gives us time. All right, I want you to read Exodus 31. Look at verse 15. We're skipping down a little bit. God says, six days shall work be done. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. And we're going to get to the Sabbath part in a minute. But he basically says the same thing in Exodus 20. We looked at the Ten Commandments last week. This is the fourth commandment. Do you remember? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Now, if you were to ask people who knew the Ten Commandments and you said, hey, what's the fourth commandment? And they knew them, they would probably say, remember the Sabbath, right? Well, that's not all of it. God had an opinion on the work part as well. <laughs> I'm giving you six days to do your work. 
Now, does that mean I can only take one day off a week? No, but it does indicate that God's plan for them was to be productive, was to contribute six days a week. Now, one of the products of the Protestant Reformation that we call it 500 years ago was this thing we call the Protestant work ethic. It doesn't mean that non-Protestants didn't work hard. That's not what it means. But as people got back to the Bible and understanding God's plan and will, they came to this conclusion. God values hard work. God values productive work. Hey, you know what? God actually values excellent work. Okay? So what the Protestant reformers believed from the Bible, and so it impacted the society that believed that. Now, Proverbs has a lot to say about the value of hard work, but, but Paul actually directly addresses the issue with the church in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. What was happening is there were some people in the church who were so spiritual, they decided to quit working. And they were just going to wait for Jesus to come back. Really, that's what was happening. This is what Paul told them. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, he's getting strong here, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. He's basically saying, have nothing to do with these people. So what is this tradition that Paul left with the church? He says in verse 7, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. He goes on, verse 9, it was not because we don't have that right you know, to not work, but to give you an ex- in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. That's in the Bible. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness. You're not busy at work, but busy bodies. I know a few people that describes they're on next door neighbor all day long. Okay, and I hear they're complaining and they're whining and they're getting into other people's business because they have nothing better to do. Now such persons, Paul says, we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly, to earn their own living. And we're not legalistic about this as followers of Jesus, but here's the reality. We only have so much time to play our part. On this planet, in this body, we we only have so much time. And God expects us to use our time wisely. Ephesians 5 says this, right right before he says, be filled with the Spirit. He says, look carefully then how you walk, how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. What does that look like? Making the best use of the time. Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish. But understand what the will of the Lord is. So here's a question for you to reflect on. Are you, whatever season of life you're in, are you being a good steward of the time God has given you? A good steward of the skills he has given you? A good steward of the opportunities God has given you? Listen, there's no work or opportunity that's too small for God to care about. But there's one last thing we see in the text here. To do our jobs, God gives us a choice. So you see at the end of verse 11, God told him, I gave you skills to do all this stuff. And then he finishes it by saying, end of verse 11, according to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. He 
sounds like they had a choice and God's saying, I command you. And this is what you're to do. Multiple times in these chapters, God was very specific to them about the importance of making all of these things according to all I've commanded you. Literally, he says it over and over again. It's like, okay, God, we get it. You want us to do it the way you asked us to do it. Why do you keep telling us that? Well, because obedience matters. Okay? And obedience is a choice. We can choose to use our time and our skills and our resources to contribute to God's plan. Frankly, we can use those same things for something else, like making a golden calf in the next chapter. See, nothing in your life is secular. Nothing in your life is exempt from accountability to God for how you steward what you do with your time, your resources, and your talents. I mean, he cares. It matters to him. You matter to him. He cares about your job. He cares about the work you do each day. All right? Next, when you're living by faith, Pretty simple here. Your rest matters to God. Um, again, we need to be careful because these commands were given to Israel so that they could play their part in God's plan. But in these commands, there are principles. There's truths about God, truths about us, about his design, his plan that do apply to us. And there's other texts in the Bible that indicate your rest matters to God. So if we're going to do this, first of all, we need to make it a priority. So let's read verses 12 to 14. Exodus 31. The Lord said to Moses, you're to speak to the people of Israel and say this, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Well, it, to me it's interesting that he doesn't, God doesn't remind Moses before he goes down the hill with the two stone tablets. Charlton Heston, I can see it now. Um, he doesn't remind him of any of the other Ten Commandments. But after giving all of these instructions to Moses about all these other laws, how to build the tabernacle, before he sends Moses back down the mountain, he emphasizes the need to prioritize Sabbath rest. I mean, in what I just read in the ESV, it's God said to Moses, Above all, make sure you tell them, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. It's almost like he's saying, I know I've given you a lot of commands. They all matter, but here's what matters most to me. Above all, you need to take a day off. Why does he care so much about that? Well, God says right in the text, this priority is a sign it represents something. It reminds them, um, to them, to their children, who are going to come after them, that they belong to the Lord. It's a sign that, that God has sanctified them, okay, which, you know, what that means is you've been set apart for a special purpose. It's not just so that you can get a break from your work and be refreshed, it's true, but there's actually something symbolic um, that when we take a day off, it, it communicates something. It says to God, I trust you. I'm depending on you. I'm obeying you. I belong to you. you know, I'm not defending this one way or the other, but you know, when you're hungry on a Sunday afternoon, you pull into Chick-fil-A and you go, oh, they're closed. Or, oh, I need to run and go get that craft item at Hobby Lobby, and you're like, oh, they're closed. 
okay? It's a sign. They could make a lot more money if they were open on Sundays, right? I'm not saying we have to be legalistic about this, but again, it, it, it says something to the world. When someone who's a follower of Christ says, yeah, I know I could, but I'm not going to. Remember blue laws? Okay, laws that forbid certain activities on Sundays. Some states still have them, you know, sale of liquor, etc. cetera. Um, you know, when, when you lived in a place that had pretty strict blue laws, it, to be honest, it was easier to rest. There was nothing else to do but go to church, rest. But now our culture has completely abandoned that value. I'm not promoting blue laws. You can't legislate this. It's a matter of the heart. And the fact that we don't have blue laws, guess what? If, in some ways, it forces us to live by faith and make this more of a priority. I mean, it may not matter to you. You may not feel like you need a day to rest. But here's why it's important. It matters to God. Because he has sanctified you. He set you apart for his special purpose. And a day of rest, the text tells us this. It's a sign of this. But the next principle we see here is this. We should practice it regularly. Okay, let's read verses 15 and 16. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Oh my goodness. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. Now, Notice, I changed the wording in the outline here from must to should, okay? There's no mandate in the New Testament for this kind of legalistic approach to a Sabbath day like Israel was expected to do. In fact, when the, the Jewish religious leaders confronted Jesus and his disciples about picking grain to eat on the Sabbath. Do you remember? This is what Jesus said to them, Mark 2. Then he said to them, the Sabbath, this is from Jesus, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So Jesus isn't saying there's no need for a Sabbath anymore. He's simply saying that as believers, we don't follow the law. We follow Jesus, who created the Sabbath. And Jesus cares about you. He cares about your work. He cares about your rest. He, he's Lord of everything. So does the way you work, does the way you rest, reflect that Jesus is Lord of your life. I mean, Jesus, he wants to give you rest. Matthew 11, he says this. How do we get rest? Come to me, is the invitation, Jesus says. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I mean, that tells me that your rest matters to God. He wants to give you rest. But to get that, who do you have to go to? Jesus. You have to come to him. You have to make it a priority. You have to make this a regular rhythm in your life. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to do that. There's freedom here. I'm not going to tell you what day it has to be. I'm not going to tell you what you're going to do or not do on that day. There's a lot of freedom there. But you have to be able to have an answer of how do you do that. Is God honored? Is he blessed? Is he glorified in the way that you make room for rest in your life by coming to him? Okay, you have to be able to give an answer to that. How do you come to Jesus? It's fine if you want to play golf or tennis or go to the beach or watch football. 
Okay? But you have to be able to answer, how am I coming to Jesus as a regular part of my life each day, especially on a day of rest? But here's one more thing as we do this. As we're prioritizing rest, here's what we're doing. We are reflecting the image of God. So look at the last few verses, 17 to 18. It's a sign forever. Okay, keeping the Sabbath here, having a rest day. This is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. It's a sign of that. And then he gave to Moses when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of of God. Did God really need to rest on the seventh day of creation? Like, whew, boy, that was a lot of work. I need a day off. No. I mean, God wasn't tired. He rested on the seventh day to set the standard for those who believed and trusted him and who were living by faith to follow that pattern. I mean, God keeps saying that this matters to him because it's a sign. It actually declares something. It points to something. And he says right here, what it points to is God and his design in creation. It points to the fact that we belong to God who created things in this way. It, it points to the fact that hey, we depend on him. We are trusting that he knows what he's doing because he is God. I am not. And when we prioritize coming to Jesus and resting, it reflects the image of God. In fact, the New Testament really urges us to do this in Hebrews 4. We'll close with this. Hebrews, again, is a sermon uh, to a church, probably in Rome, and he says this, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. He's talking to the church. He says, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his, okay? Following that creation example. And here's the application. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Believe it or not, rest requires effort. <laughs> In fact, we must strive for it. Life will have a way of not letting you rest. I mean, it's something you have to be intentional and work at and strive for, prioritizing it above all. Above all. Come to Jesus for that rest. Amen? Well, let's pray. God, thanks for your word, uh, not just here in Exodus, but throughout your word that reminds us Lord, there's nothing in our lives that uh, is too small. There's nothing in our lives that's not important enough for you to care about. So God, I pray that you would show us the work that you've given our hands to do. You would remind us that whatever it is that, that we're doing, we're doing it for you. So whatever season of life we're in, Lord, we want to honor you. We want to serve you. Help us to work heartily. Help us to work with excellence. But then God, help us to come to you and find the rest, whether we feel like we need it or not, because you've asked us to do it. And obedience matters. It's part of our mission. It's part of our relationship with you. So give us a new perspective on this, I pray. And help us to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen.